thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Virginia Mack, who is a person that engineered my presence here, and Liz Walker, uh, and, and you all. Thank you very much. Uh, as, um, I will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then I hope we can get a, an exchange of views, and you will explain why everything I said is wrong, and that would be fun. Uh, I just wrote a book. I published a book titled The End of Power. And the subtitle should have been uh, as, we, as We Know It. Uh, but it, it, the publisher decided that that was uh, too revealing, and therefore it has a different subtitle. The, the thesis of the book is that uh, power has now become easier to get, much harder to use, and faster to lose. And that, that holds true for everyone, everywhere, in all uh, organized human activity. It is happening in churches and religions. It's happening in national politics and in geopolitics. It's happening with armies and in the media and in the financial sector everywhere. Uh, we know that power is shifting. We, th that is a well-established trend. Uh, we know that power is moving from Europe and the United States to Asia. We know that it's moving from north to south from uh, large established uh, companies to startups, small, uh, agile, surprising startups that undermine the business models of the traditional companies. We know that it's moving and shifting from presidential palaces to town squares. And in some places, it's even shifting from men to women, uh, not as fast and as, uh, in, as widely as uh, we would like, but that too is happening. My, what I say in the book is that that's not the only thing that is happening to power. Power is not just shifting, power is also decaying. That um, the battles for power are as fierce as ever, but they are yielding diminishing returns. Once you get to have power, you can do less with that. That doesn't mean that the world is not full of very powerful entities, individuals. Of course, uh, JP Morgan, and, 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 Goldman Sachs and the Chinese leader and uh, President Obama and uh, the, the chairman of the Central Bank in Europe uh, uh, and, and the CEOs of Google, Facebook uh, uh, and others are very powerful people. There's no denying that. And there is no denying that the world is also uh, has dictators and tyrants that are still very powerful and can do uh, whatever they want. And uh, the definition of power, is, of course, is the ability of one actor to make others do what, uh, uh, do something or stop doing something. That's a very basic definition, but for, uh, and it can get more complicated than that, but for the purposes of this conversation, that's enough. So there are still a lot of centers, institutions, individuals that can make others do or stop doing something. There's no denying that. What I argue, uh, in fact, is that more is happening and that power is uh, more fleeting and more fragile. As I was writing the book, uh, I was feeling, I was very self-conscious about two things. One is that I, I was writing about power. And uh, that's very intimidating. You know, the moment you Google power and say, you know, what are some of the works here? You are overwhelmed with a tsunami of uh, geniuses that have written about power throughout history. So more or less, you could argue that everything that needed to be said about power has been said. So that was a very intimidating uh, uh, thought. And, 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 and you know, it was in the back of my mind all the time. The other thing that was on the back of my mind and very often in the front of my mind is that I was not just talking about power, but I was talking about power in a way that was going against the, the narrative, that, the dominant narrative in the world today. And you know what that is. The, the, the narrative is that power is concentrating that uh, there is um, the, the distribution of income and wealth in the world, in some places mostly, uh, is becoming more acute. There are more people that are concentrating a lot of wealth, that income distribution is becoming more skewed, and all of that is uh, concentrating all kinds of power because these people with a lot of money are able then to buy politicians and establish uh, PACs and super PACs and, inf and lobbyists that influence the policy process and distort it to their advantage. That's the vision. 
That's the vision. And, and with the financial crisis, we had the evidence that you know, a few large financial groups concentrated a lot of the assets uh, and a lot of the remaining good assets of the companies that went down. So how could I argue that power was weakening, that power was uh, uh, decaying? Those were two thoughts that, uh, that were with me all the time. I, 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 I took, it took me seven years to write this book. Uh, and uh, not just because I, uh, I'm a slow writer, but because I'm a very insecure thinker. And so that, that is part of the, of the story. So I decided that in order to deal with these two thoughts, uh, I had only one option, and that is to let the data speak. That instead of generating a narrative of my own, I would just rely on a lot of science, the best social science I could find, the best statistics I could find, the best evidence I could find, and try to master and deploy that, uh, the evidence uh, uh, in support of my main thesis. And so the book is full of examples and, uh, I, and, uh, and, and evidence. And, and again, I, there are a couple of chapters that set the, 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 the why I think this is happening, and then a bunch of chapters uh, with, about sectors. There's a chapter on the military, and another about national politics, and another about the media, labor unions. Uh, um, charities, uh, aid organizations, armies, and so on. I will not bore you with, uh, with a lot of the statistics, but let me give you a few that uh, give you, will give you a taste, will give you a sense of the kind of uh, evidence that I use to, to support the main point. Let me start with the, the most essential uh, institution in terms of the use of, uh, of power and the use of force, and that is the military. Uh, the military, I, by definition, the, 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 the institution that has the power to coerce, the, the, the use of force to make others do or stop doing something. And of course, uh, you know that military power has uh, become very different, has transformed in very fundamental ways. Uh, start with the notion that now you have uh, very informal, quote unquote, uh, groups that are capable of denying uh, established armies victory. <coughs> uh, think, for example, about Somali pirates. These are former fishermen in the Gulf of Aden that, you know, they take their rickety boats with outboard motors and uh, rocket prepared grenade launchers and. Uh, AK-47s machine gun, uh, attack, attack rifles, and they go out in, in the high seas and they hijack the largest ships in the world for ransom. And they have uh, hijacked uh, some of the biggest oil tankers and, and big yachts and passenger ships and, and, and so on. They keep them and they get money in exchange for that and you know, one of the funny collateral effects of that is that real estate uh, prices in Nairobi are booming because these pirates are becoming very wealthy and when they get wealthy, they go to Nairobi and they buy a condo. And there are lots of them. But um, the, the situation continues and the world has responded to that, of course. And by deploying some of uh, one of the most sophisticated uh, and technologically advanced uh, uh, fleet of uh, uh, vessels uh, in history. And everyone is now plying those waters. There you, you have NATO and you have the, the Russia and China and Turkey and uh, everyone is patrolling the waters to try to stop the pirates. And they're not succeeding. The, it's not that the pirates are winning, but it's clearly the pirates are denying this very large fleet the vict victory and the ability to impose their will. The same is happening with the Taliban. The Taliban are confronting one of the mightiest armies ever assembled in human history. The coalition between the Pentagon, the United States, uh, and the Brits and others are a very mighty army. And uh, well, you know, perhaps the Taliban are not winning, but the coalition is not winning either. The Taliban have been able to deny victory uh, to this very, very large uh, army. 9-11 cost half a million dollars. That was the cost of 9-11. Uh, the consequences of 9-11 are in the trillions of dollars. Some indirect consequences of the damages, 
uh, and others are as a result of the reaction of the, uh, that, that uh, sparked by 9-11. And I'm including there the war in Iraq and uh, several other things. So half a million dollars with trillions of dollars in play. There are, these are not just anecdotes about what's happening uh, in, uh, with armies. There is a fascinating study by a, a scholar called Ivan Arreguin. He decided that he was going to look into asymmetric wars. Uh, he, between 1850 to 1948, nine, 19, 1850, 1949, he identified wars and he, and he was able to measure the relative power of the two sides at war, using, using the traditional metrics of uh, the military. Size of the army, number of weapons, number of cannons, number, you know, the, it's quite easy and quite standard to, to define who is the weak uh, side in a war and who is the stronger side in a war. So he did that and he discovered that in that period, 1850 to 1949, uh, the weak side won 12% of the time. 12% of the wars that took place during that period were won by the weaker side. Then he extended that study, 1950 to 1998, and he discovered that the weak side won 55% of the time. So the weak side had a, that nowadays seems to have a higher probability. In fact, it's more likely that the weak side uh, would win rather than the, the, the stronger side. And uh, in, in the book, I discuss what are the drivers of all this, of course, uh, uh, access to technology and military technology that in the past was exclusively under the domain of the states and the military and now has become privatized and it's accessible, uh, the use of different tools uh, and so on. But that's, that's one area where power is shifting in very important ways but it's also decaying in very important ways. And I was surprised last week General Martin Dempsey who is the joint uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, gave a speech. Uh, uh, you know, you would not think that the Pentagon it would be um, aligned with these views, but he gave a speech based on, and he said, he quoted the book, and he feels that the book is right. He, General Dempsey, now believes that, yes, power is decaying, and that the military needs to have a very profound way of uh, changing uh, their way. Uh, in dealing with the new forms of armed conflict in the 21st century. Another uh, area where power is very interesting and what's happening there is with politicians and politics. Politicians are to power like trees are to sunlight. That's a natural propensity. Politicians drive towards power. It's, it's, very, it's very natural. It's almost innate. And in politics, uh, also the same trends, uh, the same trends are observable. The, the first trend is that life has become harder for tyrants. The number of authoritarian governments in the world, the world has uh, dropped uh, quite significantly. The actual, the exact statistic is that electoral democracies in the world went from 69 in 1990 to 117 last year. Today, half of the world lives in uh, political systems where they elected their leaders, half of the world. And that does not include China. If China were to democratize, you will have a world that about 80% of, uh, of the population lived under democratic regimes. That would have no precedent in human history. And what you can see is that the tyrants are, and, and, and the autocratic governments are doing all they can not to look that way. Putin in, in Russia has done all kinds of things to show that that's a democracy. And they have elections and they have campaigns and they come up with alternative uh, uh, candidates and he switches, side, he switches the seats with his prime minister, then he comes back. So you ask why? You know, wh why does he need to do that? That is so transparently fake. Uh, why doesn't he just declare himself a strongman and just be that? Well, no. Lukashenko uh, in Belarus and uh, uh, others around the world 
uh, go at great lengths to try to have the mantle of legitimacy bestowed by, by being a democratically elected leader. So that tells you something about living in, 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 in a political system that is uh, dominated by an authoritarian uh, leader. But then think about what's happening to democracies. The first thing that is happening to democracies is where there are fair and free elections that are not rigged, uh, landslides are disappearing. So you trace the, you trace the margin of victory in, demo in democracies that have elections, 1970 to last year. And you see what, you know, the, the candidate that won, by how much, what percentage was that victory? And you can see it's amazing how it shrinks and it almost, is now almost has disappeared. Of course, here and there, occasionally you have landslides in which a candidate wins by 10%. But uh, those are exceptions. The norm now is that voters don't uh, give majorities and strong mandates to their democratic leaders. And so these governments are elected and they have to deal with a very unwieldy political alignment in which they have to get into a coalitions that are very, very complicated, unstable, unwieldy, hard to manage. And therefore, as a result, the outcome and the outputs of these systems tends to stall, tends to fragment, tends to be delayed, and uh, tends to become Italy. When one thought about Italy and its uh, political system, it was very easy to make fun of the Italians, a country that did not have a government, and thank God it didn't have a government because it worked well. Uh, and, uh, you know, but now Italy has gone to the extreme, has pushed uh, uh, the Italian system, you know, it, it, now we have Italy on steroids. Essentially, they had an election, and as a result of the election, there's no government. And then they cannot assemble a government. So in theory, and in a democracy, you have an election in order to pick a leader and run the country, not in Italy. In Italy, you have an election, but they still cannot uh, get a government. So it's easy to make fun of this very extreme uh, rendition of uh, what uh, uh, Frank Fukuyama, who is here, uh, calls a vitocracy. Democracies are becoming vitocracies. Systems in which you have actors plenty of factors that have enough power to veto, to block, delay, postpone, dilute decisions. But no one seems to have enough power to push through an agenda, a program, a vision. And uh, so that is the case of Italy. Uh, but in fact, if you look around the world, you will find that elements of the Italian political system are observable elsewhere. For example, in Washington. Think about sequester. Sequester was this decision in which, because you know, we're talking about the most fundamental function of a government, which is deciding how to tax and spend. And this, the system, the government, the, the, the executive and the legislative, decided that they, because they couldn't agree, they would kick the can and create a situation that was so horrible that it will force them to make a decision. And they called it sequestration or sequester, which essentially said, if we cannot agree on what to do with the ways in which we tax and spend the American people, all hell is going to break loose because sequester is going to get uh, in place. And that is so bad that there is no way that we will not agree. Well, they didn't. They didn't agree and sequester became uh, the, 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 the reality with very, it's a very rational, very counterproductive, very, very strange. It's a self-inflicted wound in one uh, of the most mature, well-functioning democracies in the world. This is not just an Italian or an American example. In 30 out of the 34 wealthiest democracies in the world, the uh, chief executive of the country has a parliament that is in opposition. The president and the prime minister is of a political party and the parliament, the, the, the assembly, the national assembly, the congress is from a different party. And then there are all kinds of other players that force these very strange coalitions. 
And you can see that, uh, uh, of course, in many countries in, in, in Europe. You can see it in Israel. You can see it in England, where the liberal Democrats and the Tories have very, this very unwieldy arrangement that is uh, inherently unstable. You can see it in a lot of democracies in the world today. You are condemned, if you are the chief executive, to set up this very strange, uh, uh, unstable coalition that essentially mm, has a hard time delivering results and acting. Another, and, and, and that is, uh, oh, there's also a, there's fantastic statistics about how slippery things are at the top. Turnover rates in cabinets are higher than ever. The only thing that is uh, more, uh, that, uh, that is more risky as a, as a career than being a government minister is to, get, to, to be a CEO. And that will surprise most of you. But it turns out that those CEOs that run large companies with huge assets and make uh, obscene quantities of money, and they screw up, and because they screw up, they're fired by they're giving gazillion dollars uh, as a severance payment. Those people are being fired at rates that have no precedence. Companies, and now I'm moving to another set of examples, which is in the corporate, in the private sector. Companies that there is another study that shows that companies that were, uh, that made it, companies that, that were in the top 20% of their industry uh, had, in the, in the 1980s, had 90% of probabilities of staying there five years hence. So if in the 1980s you arrived, and you were in the top 20% of your league, uh, of the leagues in your, in your business, five years later, it was almost sure that was, you'd still be there. Not anymore. The same study later has now, uh, the, 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 the probability has plummeted. And now you still are, uh, there is, is it's a more probable that you will be there, but much less probable than it was in the past. The probability that your company would experience a brand damaging accident that will wipe out a very significant chunk of your uh, equity has gone from 20% in 1990 to 82% now. And, uh, you know, companies do recover and brands uh, that are powerful do recover. And Toyota had an, a brand uh, accident uh, a few years ago. You remember that the cars would go up in flames and, and, and there was a huge recall and, and Toyota's uh, shares and, uh, were uh, deeply hurt. But, uh, but still, if you run a company today, the probability that you will have a brand impairing, a brand damaging accident, it's 82%, which is almost sure. Recently, we, we saw a, fun, a, a very interesting example. In 1989, the Exxon Valdez, a super tanker, uh, had a, an accident in the pristine waters of Alaska and had a huge oil spill. The shares of Exxon went down 4% in four months as a result of that accident. Fast forward to, 19, to 2010, when you had, uh, we had the British petroleum accident in the Gulf of Mexico. When that happened, the shares, the value of British petroleum went down 13% in seven trading sessions. So the speed of, at which these things are happening is quite amazing. In the financial sector, that uh, group of super banks that emerged after the financial crisis, six groups concentrated a lot of assets. Well. Uh, several of the CEOs of those uh, large groups are no longer there. They were fired. Uh, so th they were masters of the financial universe for a few years, and they controlled very large segments of the financial sector, and they are now home or doing something else. Um, the, the other uh, groups there are, of course, you know, HSBC has a scandal. Uh, uh, JP Morgan, it's a very interesting case in which uh, uh, the CEO, JP, uh, Jamie Dimon, used to argue very forcefully. He became the public face explaining why r financial regulation was not needed, why those banks had their own systems that could never be better, that, could ne that the government could never have better systems than the systems that the banks themselves had. 
Uh, and of course, uh, the, the bureaucrats that were paid $100,000 to regulate them could never be smarter or more sophisticated than the executives that were earning $100 million or millions of dollars uh, per year. And he became very, you know, the public face of that idea until he had an accident and JP Morgan had trading losses that he didn't know and no one in his top team of uh, uh, financial wizards uh, knew. And at first it was about um, two billion dollars of losses. No, then it became three. No, then it became, so now it's about six or seven. And nobody knew. So much for the self-regulation of these entities that are uh, mm, so effective in self-regulating. So it, it, this is just to give you a flavor of the kinds of trends that uh, one can, can identify. I can go on, but I want to stop here with examples. One of, bef not before mentioning what's happening with religion, which I, I think is a is fascinating case. Um, the, the global market share for souls is being completely transformed. Uh, uh, then the Vatican, the Roman Catholics now are, uh, are changing in profound ways. Um, they, they are challenged by new forms of Christianity, by evangelical Christians, by uh, Pentecostalists, and by other forms of uh, Christian religions. And, um, and, it, and the numbers are staggering. In Brazil, in um, 1970, the census asked, what religion are you? And 90% of Brazilians said, I am a Roman Catholic. In 2010, that same census was 60%. Half a million Brazilians change from Roman Catholicism to a different religion every year. The same is happening in the Philippines, and the same is happening in Nigeria, and the same is happening in Central Europe. And so, and, and, and so on, and same with organized labor, and I could continue. The question then is why? Why is power becoming uh, so easy to contest? Why do we have all of these uh, very large, powerful institutions that are now either e losing power or becoming very constrained in the way uh, they deploy and they can use the power and what they can do with it? I use the explanation I use. Well, the first reaction that everyone has is, is the internet, of course. It's just about social media. And it's Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and Google and everything else that disintermediates power and creates all of what we know uh, about, you know, what essentially what's happening to travel uh, agents is happening to the world of power. And uh, that would be an explanation. And I disagree deeply with that, that I don't think that's the story. Because the internet and social media are tools, are technologies. And tools and technologies need users. And users have direction and motivation. So far more important than the tools that are being used is what are the sources of the, the sense of direction and the motivations that are driving those new users of these tools that are capable of challenging the established players. And that's where I start my explanation. And my explanation borrows from uh, the field of uh, economics. There is a branch of economics called industrial organization that looks at the economics of imperfect competition, looks at barriers to entry, uh, and looks at a bunch of things that you study normally in, in here, those of you that are in economics or in the, in the business school. Essentially, those that have power have some unique asset that is very hard to replicate and that protects them from the uh, competition of rivals. That asset can be a technology, can be a brand name, can be history, can be the control of certain assets, uh, et cetera. And you know the list. What's happening, it can be followers if you're a religion, or it can be voters if you're a political party and, and members of your party. Or if you have a labor union, is how many members you have in your labor union. So, it's a wide range of unique assets. What I argue that is happening is that the barriers that are shielding the powerful are no longer exerting their protective function as they did in the past. That there are very important forces at work in the world today that are making the shields less protective. 
And there is a long list of factors that I think are lowering the, 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 the capacity of these barriers to protect the powerful. And to simplify them, I group them in three categories that I call revolutions. And I claim that the world everywhere and in every sector is being touched by these three revolutions that I call the more revolution, the mobility revolution, and the mentality revolution. The more revolution essentially is um, to try to capture the notion that we live in an age of profusion, in an age where there is more of everything. Touch any variable, look at any variable you want in the world, from medicines to guns to political parties to countries and of course to people, and compare what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and what it is today. And you'll be surprised at the explosive growth of everything. And that has consequences for power. Start with the fact that we have more people. It took humanity until 1950 to get to two billion. Now we are seven, and we just added two billion in the last 20 years. Not only we are more, but we are living in the youngest planet uh, that we have had in rec since recorded history. Never the human population was as young as it is today. Of course, there are countries in which that's not the case. There are countries that are graying and so on. But on average, if you look at the planet, average age, young. So we are more and we're younger and we now live in cities. For the first time in history, Humanity, there are more people living in cities than in uh, farms and in the fields. And we're better off. Global GDP has grown five times since 1950. GDP per capita has grown three and a half times. The number of countries that the World Bank categorized as low income has declined. Th 36 countries that the World Bank uh, classified as low income are now middle income since 2006. The middle class in the world is the, large, is the fastest growing segment in humanity today. There's no other demographic that is growing faster than the middle class everywhere, except in rich countries. And so you have this very interesting phenomenon in which you have the middle class that was established in, 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 in the rich countries in Europe and the United States mostly, that feels embattled, insecure, uh, that they're not sure that their children can have the same standards of living. Uh, at the same time that you have a growing middle class elsewhere, from China to Mexico and from Brazil to Indonesia or Turkey or uh, in a lot of fast growing uh, emerging markets. All of this has consequences for, um, for power. Uh, and then no, again, the numbers are quite surprising. Africa's economy has doubled in the last 20 years. The size of the Africa's economy is now twice what it used to be. Internet users in Africa went from zero to 700 millions in 20 years. Zero to 700 millions. So all of that, uh, I claim, has consequences for power. And, no, it is, and then th that, th that brings me to the second revolution, which is the mobility revolution, which is not only are we, there is more of everything, but that more of everything moves more. And not just people, but money and ideas and goods and services and, uh, uh, and, and pandemics and financial crisis and uh, everything moves more. And the numbers about that mobility are also staggering. Uh, the, the number, for example, uh, the, the, the number of um, uh, Cargo containers has multiplied by 120 times. Uh, the, of course, the, the, the frequency and intensity of cross-border trade, but also of cross-border money flows of all kinds is also explosive, and so on. And that's the mobility revolution that together with the more revolution creates the conditions for uh, the mentality revolution very profound changes everywhere, uh, in some places more than others, but the trend is everywhere. Profound changes in expectations, aspirations, uh, ways of uh, tolerance for phrases like, you gotta do this because that's the way it's uh, always been done. That phrase is no longer, uh, does no longer uh, hold as much sway in families, but also in companies and in <coughs> countries and uh, everywhere else. Uh, 
Um, there are plenty of examples, but one that I, I always mention because I think is very revealing is divorce rates in India are soaring among the elderly, initiated by the women. These are arranged marriages. If you are an elderly couple in India, it means that you were married 30, 40 years ago, and normally that was an arranged marriage. Well, the women are walking out of those marriages for a variety of reasons. They are more empowered, they're more informed, they have uh, uh, more material opportunities, and they have more information. Same is happening in some of the Gulf countries. And this is not just anecdotal. The University of Michigan started 40 years ago something called the World uh, Values Survey, in which they went to a large number of countries uh, with a very large uh, survey sample, and they asked every year about uh, values and about attitudes. And again, if you look at the numbers there and the trends, it is quite staggering how the world has changed in very basic values. And so all of this has to do with power. The more revolution overwhelms the barriers that shielded the powerful. The mobility revolution helps uh, uh, challengers to circumvent the barriers. And the mentality revolution undermines the barriers from below. Together, you put it together, you shake it, and you have a world where the powerful can do less with the power they have and last, long, last less time uh, in power. Uh, let me stop here because I think I spoke more than what I said I would. And uh, there are two questions that I'm sure we can discuss. Uh, one is, well, one is uh, three questions actually. One is, is it true? And second is, so what? Who cares? And the third is, what to do with this? What to do with this if you are going to run a company or if you are going to run a government or if you are going to run your family or be a member of your family? It has implications for all of these things. So let me stop here and just take your questions. That's a great question, and, um, and I think that that question is sector specific, right? You, one fantastic uh, example of changing patterns of uh, leadership selection happened like three weeks ago in Rome. So for the first time in 700 years, a pope said, I can't do this. And, and, and uh, the voting process started in a very peculiar, you know, the College of Cardinals in, in a conclave decided. But if you look at the issues that they were dealing with, and if you use, look at the composition of who was voting, and then you look at the outcome of who was selected, that tells you a very interesting story. But it's also true for other kinds of leaders, and I think it's, uh, the, the conversation is different if you talk about the leaders in the corporate world, or if you talk about social leaders, or if you talk about political leaders. And I think it's different in every case. There is a prescriptive answer to your question, uh, which is not what are kinds of leaders ought to be are being selected, but what are the characteristics? If you are in a leadership position, what, what, what it would be good ideas uh, to keep in mind, to take uh, the takeaways from, from this vision? The first is that in order to be a leader, especially if you are in the, in the private sector or in general, you need to be very, very good at what you're doing. You need to be excellent. In order to be excellent at what you're doing, you need to be obsessive. And you have to be um, highly specialized. If you are very, very highly specialized, you now risk uh, more than ever the consequences of tunnel vision, the consequences of not having a peripheral vision. You are becoming so good at what you do. And you are such an expert in what you do. You know everything about what you do, but you don't have the time or the incentives to look around you. And you don't have enough of a peripheral vision. If you don't have enough of a peripheral vision, a guy called Craig issues a list that destroys your business model. <laughs> you know, she knows, she was there. <laughs> uh, the Washington Post 
uh, did not imagine, there was not, uh, you know, the notion that, or the New York Times, the notion that your competitor would come from something called a Craig that had a list uh, was unimaginable to these very, very large behemoths. Kodak was a monopoly for decades. You know, if you had a Kodak moment, you, everyone knew what that was. Kodak was a dominant player in the world uh, of photography, uh, and Kodak went bankrupt. At the same time that Kodak went bankrupt, uh, a company with uh, two years old, uh, with 13 employees, was sold for a billion dollars, called Instagram. Do you imagine, the pe I'm not suggesting that Kodak went bankrupt because of Instagram, I think Kodak went bankrupt because of Kodak. But, but do you imagine the people, the leadership team at Kodak, thinking and saying, well, you know, we may have a competitor with a bunch of kids uh, that are going to have an app. And they are going to become very important in the world, in the way the world uses and distributes uh, and, uh, and, and keeps pictures. So that is, these are just two examples of uh, how the tension between uh, being very, very good and specialized at what you do and the need to reconcile that with uh, peripheral vision because your competitors and your challengers are, are going to come from places that you cannot uh, easily track. Another um, implications of what I'm saying about uh, power, if you're a leader, is beware of size. Don't assume that because you are in the midst of, you know, you, you are running or you are in a large size company, that will protect you. Very often, large size uh, becomes uh, counterproductive. It becomes slower, it becomes uh, more difficult to, to, to handle, uh, and so on. Um, the third is don't believe that the, if you get to have power, be very careful with assuming that that's there for, for good. S start every day with the notion that that may be evaporated, uh, that your power may be gone very quickly for reasons and from sources that you cannot even fathom. Uh, and, and the third and the last perhaps, be careful with uh, staying too long in organizations that are vitocracies. Vitocracies are also present in the private sector, in universities, in multilateral organizations, and places where there are just enough people with power to block everything and not enough people, not enough power centers to get things done. And you can still continue and be successful for a while or you know, be a meddling uh, success story but it's, 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 you'll never get very far because the company is essentially is, is a Gulliver tied down by Lilliputians, right? And it's thousands of strings that limit what you can do because everyone has their, you know, can raise their hands and say, we're not doing this. And then you end up uh, having to settle for the minimum common denominator uh, and doing whatever pleases everyone. And that normally doesn't deal effectively with the issues at hand. Uh, I, that was a long-winded answer, but I, I, I like the subject. <laughs> sir, <laughs> sir. Thank you for being here. You can talk a lot about less people with power, but I would like to hear your opinion about what the desire is. <laughs> and what do you think the current desire is for profit at all costs? I, I, I knew I would get a, qu a question. <laughs> Uh, Venez I'm Venezuelan, uh, as, as you know, and I think there are several of my compatriots here. Uh, we, are, we have an election on, on, on Sunday, and it's the th uh, fastest snap election in history. Uh, the president died, and there is a, a snap election was called. Um, I can only say a couple of things. One of the most frustrating things of being a Venezuelan abroad is the gap between perceptions about uh, President Chavez and his legacy uh, and the reality. And one of the most painful things one, needs, one has to do all the time is explain why the common wisdom about the country is deeply, deeply misinformed. Uh, and so that's something I do <coughs> constantly and it gets boring to me, but it needs to be done and it's very frustrating. That is to say, that is the preamble to say that when you think about politics in Venezuela and the fact that there is an election and there is a candidate that is an incumbent, 
uh, that is being challenged by an opposition force, uh, that is democracy. That, you know, there is, a, that's the normal, you know, President Obama was in government and he had a challenger uh, and, uh, you know, and President Obama won. That has nothing to do with the reality of my country. In my country, the uh, government, uh, there's not a, an opposition party uh, uh, confronting uh, an, an, a, 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 an, a, another party that happens to be in government. This is an opposition party that has to deal with a state, a petro state full with full of money and without checks and balances, and uh, with the ability to just uh, skew the game uh, in any way they, they, they want. And so that is the part of the story. And the larger story about Venezuela, and what you will be reading in newspapers, those of you that are interested in uh, uh, months to come, is the economic implosion of the country. Venezuela is going to go through an economic crisis uh, of the likes that the country has never seen before. And that, of course, will have many political consequences, uh, some of them not good for freedom. Yes? Uh, if you look at the countries that are not democracies, um, most of them are uh, countries that are oil rich. So oil and democracy don't coexist well. Um, and that's a problem. And therefore, because what happens with governments that are not democratic that get hold of power in an oil country, the first thing they do is they control the security services and the army. And then they start giving things away. Uh, uh, to the population. Uh, and that creates uh, a, a, a nation of mendicants, essentially, that depend. There is very few jobs in the private sector. So if you uh, want a job, you have to toe the line of the government and just get a government job. In order to get a government job, you have to put on your shirt, your red shirt, and go out in the streets and, and say that you believe in the, in, in the revolution. Uh, and that will continue to be uh, the case for a while. Uh, however, uh, I was just there, and it's, and I now look at the world through the eyes of the three revolutions, and the three revolutions are there. Uh, there is more of everything, including people, uh, and people that move, and uh, you know, power requires a, a captive audience, and the mobility revolution is undermining that. Uh, and there are many ways now to circumvent uh, uh, powers, and they are quite clearly visible in the country. And there is a very profound mentality revolution. So I don't know the outcome, but my main concern is that oil will continue to be a curse. Following up that, um, <laughs> this is uh, like from a different perspective. Uh, is Venezuela, you think that it's going to enter into a crisis economic crisis soon? You know, whatever the results or like the turn out. What would you say would be in the future if this oil support to other Latin American countries will be sustainable? It's going to be difficult, but not impossible, especially if you have the capacity to, 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 to repress the reactions for, to, to a, in popular economic measures. Uh, one of the, again, one of the frustrating stories that one has frustrating because of the gap in perceptions is the role that Cuba plays in Venezuela. And that is a fascinating story. Again, uh, you have a small bankrupt island uh, ideologically bankrupt and financially bankrupt that is, was able to gain control of the largest reserves of oil in the planet without one shot. And you have the United States, which is a superpower, watching. And so there is a fantastic story there that is not well known, and essentially the story is that the Cuban government now runs uh, very important uh, aspects of Venezuelan affairs, and for the Cuban system and the Cuban regime, is indispensable 
to continue to receive the support it gets from Venezuela. Uh, and therefore, they have a very powerful, very strong vested interest in sustaining uh, the current policy. But uh, if you want, we can have a Venezuela-only session after we, we, we finish. And I'll meet, I'll meet with, you, with all of you interested, and that's just now. <laughs> I launched my book uh, the, uh, on uh, the day of the, uh, the publication day, and I was doing my book promotional thing, was March 5. And I had a bunch of uh, media interviews scheduled, and I was on television. Uh, and you know, instead of talking about the end of power, everyone wanted to talk about the end of Chavez. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so you know, it's part of doing this in this uh, period. Yes. A great question, which has the implication. Uh, the way I get asked the same question is uh, the possibility of uh, a reversal in the, in the change. You know, could it be that we can go back to a situation in which the powerful can use uh, the shields to concentrate and retain power because some of the three revolutions that are uh, limiting the effect of the shields uh, uh, become weaker? And I don't see it. And if you think, what are the arguments and what are the, what are the variables that I include in the, in the three revolutions, I, I, don't, I don't see which ones will, re, will revert. The only one that may revert slightly is population, depending on, on what of the uh, population growth hypothesis one, uh, one believes. But there is a hypothesis that we are now peaked in terms of uh, population growth in the world, and that uh, in the next 50 years, we're going to see uh, a, a more stable uh, growth path. But even but that's, that may be the case, but you're talking about a negligible number in terms of the quantity of uh, people that are uh, already there and pressuring uh, governments uh, because of the other two revolutions. Um, yeah, please, please, please. Right. So I wrote a, a, a piece called uh, Malthus, Marx, and Markets, and essentially dealt with that. Uh, okay. And uh, if you look at any of the conversations about uh, resource constraints in global growth or in the way we live, you're going to find that uh, you can place uh, arguments in those three baskets. You either have the Malthusians that essentially say, well, the world population and the world need for resources is growing faster than the capacity of the world to supply that need. And therefore, something has to give. Then uh, you have Marxists that say, no, we don't have a resource constraint. What we have is bad distribution. A German consumes 150 times more uh, electricity per day than a Bangladeshi. And the wealthy consume far more energy uh, and everything than the poor. So let's, if there is enough for everyone, it's just a matter of distributing it better. And then you have the proponents of the market that says the market will take care of things. Uh, shortages mean higher prices. And higher prices will mean that some people can afford less. So if there is higher prices for gas, uh, people will drive less. Uh, if there are higher prices for meat, people would eat more something else. And therefore, and moreover, mm -hmm. uh, the market will also take care of things because it will create incentives uh, for inventors and for innovators. And so someone that comes up with a way of feeding the world that is very, very inexpensive and not carbon intensive can make a lot of money. If someone comes up with an engine that doesn't consume as much energy, or somebody invents a technology to exploit shale, which is what happens, and is creating a revolution, that would be an example that the market uh, view of things 
uh, will say, you know, we we'll say, well, you know, we were all worried about, uh, you are probably familiar with the conversation about peak oil. Peak oil is a theory that says that there is a finite uh, uh, supply of reserves, of oil reserves in the world, <coughs> and that uh, we have reached the peak. We, the world has already consumed uh, more than half of it, and from now on, uh, you, you, it's going to be less uh, oil available until shale gas happened, right? And now, uh, the, the world is now one in which instead uh, of, uh, in, in which of, in, in, of scarcity, you have a glut of oil. And people are talking about uh, peak uh, supply rather than peak, uh, peak oil. Yes? And everything else, yeah. So um, I believe that, again, uh, China, uh, the three revolutions, and I apologize for going back to that view all the time, but if you, see, if you look at China, you look at the numbers, you will see that the three revolutions are quite amazing in their presence there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're talking about a country in which, uh, ha you know, literally tens of millions of people every year move to the cities. And that, by definition, has alters the structures of power. You have very profound changes in expectations and attitudes. You have the fastest growing middle class in the world. And so that middle class now uh, no longer wants a school. Now they have a building. The government was able to build something, and it called it a school. And they send the children there. But now they want more than that. They want good quality in that school. They want their children to learn something when they go to school. The same with a the hospital. They have a building now that where there was nothing and they didn't have anything. Now they have a building called a hospital, except that they go and they don't get the quality of health they want. And so their aspirations are moving from basic uh, needs to more sophisticated demands for services. And we know that governments have a very hard time delivering services. Governments are good at building infrastructure. So a building, a highway, housing. What is very hard is to be very good at delivering what happens in those services. And there is a frustration there. So um, I have a friend, a colleague called Ming Xing Pei. Uh, in my book, he's the best sinologist in the world today. Uh, Ming Xing believes that in the, last, in the, la in the next 20 years, uh, the Communist Party of China will no longer be able to run the country. Essentially because the changes in, the so in that society are going to be so fast and complex that the current structure with the, 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 the Communist Party will not be able to respond uh, in, in a timely, effective way. And it's going to create all kinds of uh, dislocations. Rivers. There is no doubt that uh, it's <coughs> that China is facing an ecological crisis, and but China is also facing a fiscal crisis, and maybe facing a financial crisis, and maybe facing a, a, a political crisis. So the question is: Will the crisis that China has be will have? be 1990s vintage or 1960s vintage. In the 1960s, when China had a crisis, it lasted for a very long time. In the 1990s, where the world had crisis, the crisis very, very profound, but had a very quick recovery. Remember the Asian crisis, the Russian crisis, the, the, the Mexican crisis, you know, very harsh ups and downs in, 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 in GDP. And, and, and. So it's not clear if uh, an economic crisis in China or an ecological crisis would lead the country to chaos or is manageable.